Okay, and we are back for today. We are going to jump ahead a little bit to chapter 10. We'll start with chapter 10.1. We're going to be looking at the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, or we're going to begin looking at the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. There's a lot more to come. All right. So just to bring you up to speed, since we jumped over 9.3, here's what's happened since we left off in 9.2. So, after serving two years as President of the United States, George Washington, the George Washington, decided to retire and return to Virginia. He wanted to get back to Mount Vernon. He wanted to just be a farmer. He was tired of all the hustle bustle of being the president. And his vice president was a guy named John Adams, a guy from Massachusetts. You might remember him from before winter break when we talked about the Boston Massacre. He's the attorney that represented the British Redcoat soldiers in that trial. Anyways, John Adams defeats Thomas Jefferson in a very, very close election. Jefferson had for a time been the Secretary of State for George Washington. So Adams becomes the second president of the United States, just a razor thin margin of victory there. A few electoral votes is what separated him from Thomas Jefferson. But as Adam takes, Adams takes presidency unfolds, there's a whole bunch of scandals. And after his four-year term, he was not very popular with his own group, the Federalists, or the opposing group, which was led by Thomas Jefferson. So in the election of 1800, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson would face off again, back-to-back -back contests. So this is maybe the craziest election that ever happened in the United States history. It's certainly one of the most interesting. This is back from 220 years ago now. So here's something that's important to remember. At this time in American history, the candidate who received the most votes in the Electoral College became the president, and the candidate who received the second most votes in the Electoral College became the vice president. Okay, this is really very, very different from what we see today. Now, a president will have a running mate who will be the vice president. It's the vice presidential candidate, more or less. And whichever ticket, meaning the president and vice president, gets the most electoral votes, they are the victors. They become the president and vice president. We never had any of this possibility for splitting between political parties that existed back then. We don't have that anymore. In 1796, Adams won the presidency because he won 71 votes in the Electoral College, and Jefferson had ran against, or Jefferson ran against Adams, and he received 68 votes in the Electoral College, making him Adams vice president. So even though these two guys really didn't like each other, they became, because of the way the chips fell in the Electoral College contest, the president and vice president. Different factions in the government. Maybe Jefferson was starting the first legit political party. This is interesting because not only did Adams and Jefferson have different views on government, they really, really disliked each other too. So let's put this into a modern context. Let's think about if we still had this system right now. So if we still use the same system for presidential elections, that would mean that the candidate who won the most electoral votes in 2016, oops, pardon me, in 2016 would be the president and the candidate who received the second most votes in 2016 would be vice president. How would that look? Right over here. So if we still use this same process to elect president and vice president, today we would have President Trump, and we would not have Mike Pence as vice president. We would have Hillary Clinton. All right, so back to election of 1800. It is a crazy, crazy election. Thomas Jefferson runs for president as a Democratic Republican. That's his political party. Here's a name you might know for a couple of reasons. He's featured, I know, in the movie or the musical Hamilton. He's also famous for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Aaron Burr is also running as a Democratic Republican. We see John Adams running as a Federalist. Remember, he's the incumbent. He's the president at this time. Also running as a Federalist is a guy named Charles Pinckney. So we have a crowded field. We're used to two legit contenders or two legit tickets now. But back then, we had four candidates who were running. By the way, this is a linked video. It's about three minutes. It explains the whole wacky election of 1800 uh, for you. So I recommend you guys all watch that. It will be in the slides. You can click on it anytime you want. So here's something interesting. There's another reason why this is crazy. The totals, after the votes are tallied, the Electoral College has, has uh, tallied the votes. Thomas Jefferson gets 73 votes. John Adams gets 65 votes. But look at this. 
the other candidate from the Democratic Republican Party, Aaron Burr, also got 73 votes. He's now tied with Thomas Jefferson. Now, we still use the same rule in these days that whoever gets the most electoral votes is the president. Whoever gets the second most is the vice president. But what do we do? We have a tie. What happens when we have a tie? All you constitutional scholars after the civics unit ought to know, according to the Constitution, when there's a tie in the Electoral College, the House of Representatives decides the winner. The House chose Thomas Jefferson for president and Aaron Burr for vice president. There's a little bit of an extra story here, but we'll save that for another day. So Jefferson and democracy. This is the beginning of his presidency. So big question, how is Jefferson's presidency different from Washington or Adams' presidencies? So here's a couple notable things about him. Jefferson was a humble man who favored smaller government. He didn't like a super strong federal government. He wanted the United States to continue being a nation of small farmers. This was a guy who was a farmer, among other things, among a lot of other things, from Virginia. He reduced the number of federal employees, showing that he was serious about having a smaller government. And he reduced the size of the military as well. He also let some of the acts passed during Adams' presidency expire. And he used tariffs to reduce the amount of debt held by the government. Remember, tariffs have been used to protect domestic industries and businesses and also to generate revenue for the government. It's like adding a tax on imports. All right. How did Jefferson interact with that other branch of the government, the judicial branch? Before leaving office, John Adams filled vacant judgeships with Federalists like him. Remember, this is John Adams, okay? This is the period of time between when Thomas Jefferson won the election of 1800 and when Thomas Jefferson was actually inaugurated in March of that year. So during that time, John Adams decided, well, before I'm, I'm gone, I'm going to fill all these vacant judgeships with Federalists just like me. So that was called, it was part of what's called the Judiciary Act of 1801. So it's a big problem for Jefferson. Why, you ask? Well, because federal judges were appointed for life. You know that. There's nothing he could do about it. So he's already setting himself up to have maybe not the most pleasant, positive relationship with the uh, court, the federal courts. They were going to be operating from a same philosophy or a very different philosophy from his own. So he was bound to face challenges to his programs and policies. We are going to continue this in chapter 10.2. Hang in there. Stay strong.